Hello and welcome to part 7 of making every wings of fire dragon into a plushie in alphabetical order. In the last videos we made albatross, auklet, anemone, an unzippable arctic, blister, blaze and burn, blue and battle winner, my own OC calamity, and also coral and chameleon in his natural form. Here's an update to the special extra character wild round list. Last time the 28 unnamed sea wing princes shot up to the top of the boats. Don't you fret, I have a plan, and they shall be made eventually. Not all of them are unnamed, but most of them are. Coral is quite prolific when it comes to filling the entire sea with her spawn all swimming around, but not quite as prolific as another dragon which we shall be making in this video. Onwards with the plushies. First up is Clay. Precious little Clay. Not little, this is a large boy. Nobody else knows anything about girth. Clay is the MVP of pure width. Before we can even start, I have to figure out what I was thinking when I made this pattern. I've made a mudwing before and gave him to my friend. Why does it have flaps? I completely cannot recall any of the process to put this together. Even the writing on the pieces has this air of uncertainty. Wait, there's two horns and they both say mudwing and they're completely different from each other. I guess we're starting from scratch. Which is fine. It gives me an opportunity to describe a few tips on pattern making. This pattern is not an overly complicated shape. Therefore, it's just drawn out as such on paper. And if I was to make it 3D, I would use thread to measure the length of the gusset locations. It will need a chest and a spine. I like to mark key locations like the butt and the middle of the chest so you know how to taper your gusset properly. First, I'm tracing out his body seam allowance, and then I'm tracing out the full shape of his body, which is the same as the sea wing, and then I'm getting these little jigsaw pieces and fitting them all into the body and tracing them out individually. It doesn't make a huge amount of sense yet, but it will eventually. Now we need to trace and cut out all the other parts of our mud wing. Despite the narration of Clay insisting his scales are ordinary and dull, He's a very pretty brown dragon in my mind, and the orange of his main scales is a very weirdly specific colour. Kind of surprised that I could find what I think is essentially perfect for him. When you get up to the jigsaw puzzle pieces, just draw a big seam allowance around them. It'll be okay, so long as the shapes are larger than the ones drawn out on your main body piece, which is what we're going to be following as a template. And now we begin sewing. The mud wings have two separate spine parts because I think the neck ruff and the tail spikies are most important to the overall look of them as a sort of crocodilian dragon. I stuff these lightly for volume. They're pretty big spikes after all. I leave a gap in the back part when sewing it up and place the neck spikes and tail spikes like so. It's a little bit hard to sew over stuffed spikes to be honest. It's so meaty. I usually don't stuff them for this reason, but the mud wings deserve it. And once all this is complete, it's time to work on the body sides, which need their own preparation. The other coloured pieces go on the body like a puzzle, which I'm trying to show here. We line this up on the other side so that the colours are outwards rather than inside the dragon at the end of the process. And then, one colour piece at a time, we sew along this line here down to the meeting point of the next colour. We follow the lines drawn on the back because they will be even between one side and the other, mostly. Once it's sewn up, we use scissors to snip off the excess seam allowance right up to the stitches, but don't actually cut the stitches or it'll be its own disaster. And then we can add the second colour to our body, the chest colour. You should just let the overhang of the first colour go under the seam allowance of the second, because if it's too short, it'll leave unfortunate gaps in the colours. And then we slice off the excess again. I should mention to always leave the seam allowance that isn't actually against the stitches, because when we sew the body together, you'll want the colours to stick into the seam of the chest. And now we have our fairly sharp colour transitions. If you have an embroidery machine, you can use that, I think. I don't know how to use them. But we're doing the other side of the body now, in the same order, snipping all the seam allowance that is against a seam line. 
Once that's done, we can start sewing up the body like all the other plushies, attaching the spine to the body and sewing it up on both sides. This part is slightly easier because you're not sewing through multiple layers. The chest, on the other hand, is a bit more tricky, and you have to pay attention when pinning it together in order to make sure the extra colour snippets are stuck into the seam allowance and sewn up. Now we turn him right side out. This was a moment of truth for me because it turned out exactly how I envisioned. That's crazy. It's clay, so he was stuffed firmly and chonkily, and also weighted down with beads. Although the beads are for every dragon, because I like weighted plushies. Clay is a big boy, but smaller than the extra large dragons. These guys come in three sizes now, I've decided. Medium, small, and large. Here's a minuscule quail for scale. I'm not hurting it, by the way, when I grab it. This thing is lighter than a cotton ball, and I'm, like, just barely grasping it. But they don't have a great idea of height, so you kind of have to palm them so they don't leap off a table. I returned it to its mother, who was biting me, which is fair. It's just weird that birds come in such small sizes. Freaks me out every time one of them is born. Clay would be amazed by this, too. Which he is totally right about, by the way. Clay might be a hungry boy, but he doesn't eat everything. And he might think about eating these quails, but he wouldn't. I certainly think about it. They look like popcorn. I picked the slightly thicker, stubbier horns from my original pattern, which are sort of like a water buffalo. Now I'm attaching all his facial features down. My dad's opinion at this point was I had to make Clay look extra friendly and approachable. I don't know if that's possible much beyond the big brown eyes he has. All the dragon plushies sort of look friendly, even the super evil ones. It's in their nature as a plush to be holdable, huggable, and the like. All great friendship qualities. Oh yeah, when stuffing the mudwing head, I tried to put extra stuffing into the nose to give them a thicker snout. And now we attach his big, boofy head to his body. Clay has a very thick buffalo-like neck. The graphic novels capture that effortlessly. I love Clay. He's a great character to be in the mind of when we are first introduced to the series. When I was reading the books, I thought it was good. I love dragons, after all. But then, in the Dragonette Prophecy, when Peril shows up, that's when the whole book was elevated to my favourite thing. Peril and Clay are meant to have mirrored sort of internal arcs here in this book, as they both are told by other characters that they were born to be a monster. Not only is the bantery dialogue between him and her extremely fun, but it's also a sweet character arc, considering how gobsmackingly evil every other dragon so far has been. Like, yikes, maybe the dragons were born to be evil. But not Clay. He's so good that it makes Peril stop and rethink her status as a living weapon too. And Peril is definitely in possession of an evil score that is quite significant. Not one I can name yet, because I haven't gotten into the nitty gritty, but it takes a pretty significantly good force to balance that one out. Unfortunately, we do not have goodness scores, just evil ones, that get points taken off for goodness, definitely a 10 out of 10 for awesomeness, and a 0 out of 10 for evilness. So yay! Now it's time to make the wing part of mud wings, which are definitely not as annoyingly complicated as some other dragon that we shall be making in this video, which I am grateful for. Also, when Clay saves that human who turns out to be Leaf in the Skywing Palace in the first book, that's kind of like the dragon universe equivalent of saving a kitten from a tree. Also, when sewing all of his limbs down, I make sure the leg is attached, and then I put this sort of thigh slash shoulder scale colour change over the top and sew that down too. I think this is important to the design of the mudwings, and also makes a good transition between the orange of his back legs and the brown they're going on to. We also attach his wings whilst we're deworming clay. From an above angle, his thighs are extremely meaty. Very epic. Now, time for the toes. And Clay is... Wait a minute, I forgot something. Clay has a scarred thigh from his run-in with the Dragon Bite Viper. I completely forgot about that. I'm mixing up some fabric paint, which feels really soft by the way. It doesn't interfere with the cuddliness, really, but it does look more like a burn mark on such a little area. Or a venom sizzle hole. Thanks, Peril. Now Clay is done. The best, cutest mud boy, 
and my best friend's favourite character, so that makes him extra special in my eyes too. My friend has very good taste. Now I shall finally be able to put up the Mudwing pattern and complete my collection of the original seven tribes. You can download them for free on Patreon. Um, in probably a day or so, once I recover from editing this long video. And now I'm putting him up on the shelf, which won't be permanent, but that's where they are for now. Next up on our epic plushy journey is Clear Sight, the most powerful and cool Nightwing ever, or at least that's what I think of her. Also, I'm running out of this purple fabric after making several bonnies from FNAF. So, fingers crossed I'm going to make it to a full Nightwing. I use 5mm Pile Minky for all of my plushies. This stuff is so fluffy, and it gets everywhere. It's worse than glitter. I'm pretty sure I eat it sometimes. The Nightwings are one of my favourite tribes, but it's actually pretty hard to make them because black fabric is resistant to showing detail and also extremely annoying to mark your sewing lines on at the get-go. Also, annoyingly, most Nightwings are very scarcely described and so most of them wind up being a black-on-black -black dragon, which if I made them all to be exactly like that, it would be super hard to tell them apart. So that's why Clearside is purple. Also because I love the colour purple. It's one of my favourite colours, behind pink and green and yellow and rainbow, and I can never pick a favourite colour now I'm not in kindergarten. It's too much of a responsibility. And now to cut the seam allowance off limbless, headless, inside-out clear sight. This is very brutal. Unfortunately, I got more sick and needed to be quarantined off into a new location, my only company being this tiny clay sculpture, which was the first thing I 3D modelled myself. He's actually a pretty good clay, and he sits on my Twilight Sparkle purple tiny PC case. You can't see this because of the magic of editing and black hole time dilation, but Clearside has actually taken me the very longest time out of all of the dragons so far. Even longer than Battle Winner, who failed one time and who bit me mercilessly upon a second wiring attempt. Even longer than Coral and Orklet. I'm just too sick to get up and do anything and I have to be educated on top of that. At least Clearsight would approve of that last thing. But it is super annoying, so if you're one of the people who wondered why it took me a while to get this video done, it's headaches and homework. Two of the final bosses of my life right now. Anyways, Clearsight is slowly coming along now I'm not laying with my head in the shower drain on the bathroom floor. Clearsight's eyes are described as purple, which is what made me think of her being entirely purple, because otherwise she's just a black dragon, as most of the Nightwings are described. Wait a second, I added the teardrop scales to clear sight. I forgot she doesn't have these, and it's only the mind readers who do have them. But she does deserve something special. A star for her forehead just looks sick, no arguments. I find the books that have a little bit of a lovey-dovey skew to their narration to be extremely funny, because how does one imagine a dragon with a handsome curve to his horns? Which is something Clearsight thinks about Darkstalker, by the way. Oh no, I said his name. Be gone, Spectre! You're a problem for a later date. Anyways, now to attach her head. I'm just going to slightly tilt her chin upwards in a sort of stargazing, curious look, which suits her personality well and also is just sort of fun to add. So, um... Clearsight technically committed genocide by her alarming number of dragonets. I don't even know what the morality of that is. Clearsight basically travels to a completely new continent, marries a harem of shiny boy dragons, and has some sort of insane number of kids. Which really could be anything, because Coral has 48 children. I mean, not all of them are alive, but she's got a pretty good ratio of alive baby to dead baby. Orca was in the first clutch of eggs Coral had, which means she's produced that many babies in, like, under 20 years. Clearsight lived to be well into the hundreds, so it's possible that she had even more dragonets than Coral. Now, that would be an alarming number, and would also functionally render the beetle wings extinct. I suppose another interpretation is that the beetle wings were already shifting to be silk wings before Clearsight arrived, and she just made her own unrelated fork in the genetics. So, you know, I'm not going to count that one as a point against her. 
Most of the dragons in this series are terrible parents, but Clearsight doesn't seem like she would be a bad mother. And it's kind of impressive, her ability to get to, um, when two dragons love each other very much, they kiss, and, um, that creates a tribe of super powerful bug dragons who conquer and rule an entire continent for a hundred years. Glissite also sealed Darkstalker away in stone for what she thought would be forever. But you could argue, and indeed I will, that Darkstalker did that to himself. Especially when you remember that from Darkstalker's perspective, he was considering killing her. Yikes. Forgiven for that one, she's just got an evil taste in dragon boyfriends, not her fault. Going to give her a 0 out of 10 for evilness. Now I'm painting Clearsight's wing stars, which take an annoying time to dry before you can sew them down to the body. They look a little strange without their wings, at least I've never forgotten to make those before, but it's a very forgetful video today, somehow forgot one element of each dragon. Once she's all together, she needs some feetsies. And then she needs to be lint rolled. A lint roller is a lifesaver to a tailor. And now Clearside is done. She's so purple and so cool. One of my favourite Nightwings. Which is good. We have a streak in this video of characters I think are awesome. And also, who have really nice designs that are easy to make into appealing plush in my opinion. Now Clearside is going up on the shelf to warn all the dragons near her about her horrifying visions of the end times. Clearside is also the entire reason that the next character in our list even exists. Because it's Cricket, our first hive wing. Which means we sort of have to tweak the pattern. I just wanted to tilt the tip of the tail up to accommodate the hive wing's tail stinger, which Cricket says in the text she does not have. But it is on the official poster. Look at this microscopic fluke. It's not in most of her art, except this, and a base field reference. But I want to add it, because it just looks cool to me, and you can just imagine it's useless to her. Which it probably is. I'll also use this shape for leaf wings and their tail thingy, tail flipper. I think there's a leaf wing coming up soon in the future. Hive wings have similarly sized double wings. So I made the wing pattern for the silk wings thinner to accommodate two on the back. Alright, now let's get snipping all these body parts out. He uses almost the exact same body piece as a sky wing or ice wing, the one with a straight tail. I even made sure to measure the length of the tail tip, which means that the gussets still work on it. So just use the spine and chest from that body pattern. Time to sew and see if my vision turns out okay. Starting with the hive wing back spines which are fairly big actually, the hive wings are rather pointy. I also sewed up her useless tail poker, her nose horn and her forehead horn all together, because they were all drawn on the same piece of fabric to save thread and material. You should do that too with some of your little pieces, because otherwise they might get eaten by your sewing machine. I picked a spot at the tip of the tail to sew in the poker, and then immediately messed that up, and now I'm unpicking it. Okay, well, maybe I'll just put this on the tail at the end. Because now it's time to do the sides of her body, which are pretty standard. The slight flick at the end of the tail isn't as hard to sew as the rain wings curl around or the sand wing slash night wing arched tail, so it's much easier. You could use any body for any dragon if you really wanted to, especially if you're new to sewing or it looks a bit too difficult to get that curve. Wow, look at this banana peel. That's crazy. Okay, now she's right side out. She sort of looks naked and sad without her ink blot patterns. It's time to make her head, which is always the hardest, and is extra especially hard when you are trying to see your work through snot and goobs. At this point in sewing, I'm really over this sickness. I was over it in 10 minutes, and it's been 10 days instead. Anyways, the high wing horns use the same pattern as the rain wing horns, Hive wings have really long horns looking at their reference, and the modifications I made to the rain wing to have their horns be visible also work for hive wings. So yay, time to put everything together. Also I knew I would forget something. I'm a bit cursed right now, but I remembered Cricket's eyes as being described like amber, which isn't actually correct. Whoops. Her eyes are actually more brown, like clay, or sort of a medium coloured, like a spine slash snout colour. Oh well, I can fix this once the plushie is done. 
I have a vague plan. But her eyes will always be just a little bit amber. Blue's eyes aren't the right colour they're meant to be either. So, you know, when they romantically gaze into each other's eyes, maybe Cricket absorbed Blue's yellow eyes and added it to her brown. It's real, it could happen. I've seen it happen to a girl once. Her eyes will look fine once I've made her glasses in the future anyway, which I have a vague plan about. It's a lot of vague plans. Cricket would be dissatisfied with the forethought. Now her head needs to be put on her body. I cannot stress enough that she really does look completely peeled without her splotches. Hive wings have gossamer, clear, dragonfly-like wings. In fabric, you can't really do that without compromising integrity majorly. So this trippy, shiny stuff is the best we can do. They also have a complete ton of these things. There's just so many wings, they just keep coming. More thread, more stitches. This shiny fabric is a little annoying to sew with too, because it's stretchy. Now we sew the wing bicep onto each one of the wings. I would recommend nearly overhanging the wing inside part off the wing when you sew it up, because you can snip off extra, but you can't add more to cover a gap. Now we sew some dragonfly-like-ish veins down each of the wings to the tip. I do it in two places, but it's up to you of course, there's not really a template for this stuff, just wing it. Anyways, once every single one of these needlessly shiny and overly numerous wings are finished, it's time to move on to the legs. Cricket is very interesting as a character. She is definitely not evil. In fact, most hive wings aren't, but they are complicit in like one quad squillion war crimes. Cricket can see the contradiction between dragons she knows not being evil and her ability to recognise that evil still exists, and prospers in far greater measures than the capacity of any singular mean or rude dragon to create. At first she diagnoses this problem as a lack of truth, but once she finds the truth she has to grapple with the idea that it's not the only thing required for change. Even though the Silkwings and Hivewings suffer together under the rule of Queen Wasp, the same rigidity that divides Silkwings from Hivewings is also used to separate Hivewings into class, the Hivewings are susceptible to the egotistical flattery of being the superior tribe, and any society primed to consider some of its members unfit or lesser puts an immense pressure on the individuals to not fall into the category of undesirable, even in the case of being a high wing and superficially resembling the highest status of dragon. And so Cricket recognises, essentially, that hive wings are not evil, but they have a hope and drive for climbing the social ladder of their unjust society that renders the idea of dismantling this ladder that they're focused on extremely unattractive to them. After all, the hive wings benefit in the short term from subjugation and from war, what I'm saying is, I love Cricket and her relationship with her fellow Hivewings. It's got nuances, and she's blessed with a lick of critical thinking, unlike some of these other bug jerks. So I'm giving her a 0 out of 10 for evilness too. Hey, look at that. Three good dragons in one video. That is crazy. Now to attach her ink block patterns, so she no longer looks completely naked banana. I just freehanded them and tried to vaguely make them even. But even if they aren't even, that's fine too. They're somewhat random splat patterns after all. Also, I just want to say, Malachite is so orange. I can't be the only one who misunderstood his description and imagined him super differently when Cricket was thinking about how she turned out looking like him. I actually imagined Caddy did as more orange and Malachite as black. In Caddy did's reference, she's totally cheese but she's described as yellowy orange. Anyways, there's not a lot of orange or red hive wings on my list so far, but I really like that they can come in those colour schemes. The hive wings, I think, are a little hard to make into plushies because they're almost striped. Plushies sort of need to be a solid colour somewhere, and the hive wings are super hard to pull a simple colour palette from. Oh, and now we shall finally sew down this little tail spike I wanted so badly. Also, I had to remove some of the blotches I planned because it looked like when Mummy and Daddy argued about a divorce. Cricket needs to be able to see, so let's make her glasses. I'm using some scrap card and am wrapping it in sticky tape, with the sticky side facing up just on this spot, so I can stick the glasses frames down onto it. This way I hope none of the resin leaks out. I've never used this stuff before, 
It comes in a squeeze bottle and is UV curing. It's totally crystal clear though, unlike 3D printer resin, which is actually vaguely pea colour. The sun is not exactly shining this morning, but that doesn't mean that we're not slowly being irradiated by the deadly laser that is the sun. Most people are aware that most things kill you, especially oxygen, but also especially the sun. You know how rust seems to grow on certain metals left in the weather? That's a chemical reaction between the material and oxygen, the greedy, greedy little electron thief of an element. Well, the same reaction essentially occurs in every single cell in your entire body when exposed to oxygen, so you can simply stop breathing entirely to avoid this. Like and subscribe for more epic health tips. Every time I come up here, I'm reminded of my ingenious house fix-ups that totally do not let the water in. Alright people, you didn't see time pass, but it did, and now we're here. I'm peeling off the eyeglasses from the sticky tape. A little bit of the sticky stuff came off and fused with the resin. I'm sure there's a better way to do this in the future, but for now I just wiped it off as best that I could. And then I started making her nose piece, which is actually a horn piece. It's extremely convenient that the hive wings just have this spike directly in the center of their foreheads. It's the perfect attachment point for glasses. But before we add the glasses, I have to fix the yellow eyes with my plan. It involves this brown wool and needle felting stabber. This is extremely violent. I'm stabbing her directly in the eye. It works though. Still a little yellow as I predicted it would be, but you know, good enough. I'm somewhat new to this whole needle felting concept. Now we're ready to put our glasses on, which look a little silly, as all reptiles wearing clothes do. Cricket would be bored without any reading materials to look at with her new glasses, so let's make her the Book of Clear Sight, which is technically, of course, Clear Sights. But sharing is caring. I think the Book of Clear Sight was really sweet. I'm going with purple paper because I like it and Clear Sight is purple, and also, annoyingly, I could not find the perfect parchment I had set aside somewhere. Oh well, this is it now. I'm copying out the Book of Clear Sight extremely faithfully. And then it's ready to be sewn down onto its leather casing. I added a little, um, book tongue, and then tied the book closed with some leather-looking twine. This means Cricket is all done. This was one of the most fiddly, medium-sized dragons to make out of the whole batch. But I'm glad she's done, because I love Cricket. This whole video had three of my favourite characters. How extremely convenient. I think Cricket might be nearly my favourite character. The position is kind of held open until I complete this challenge, since I'm going to have a cute cuddly version of the characters to look at and decide. Making Cricket's glasses turned out to be super fun, and now she gets to go up on the shelf with all the rest of the dragons. Can't forget the book. Thank you very much for watching. I hope to see you for the next part, and if I made your favourite dragon already, then yippee! If your favourite dragon is winter, you will have to stick with me for a very long time, RIP. Anyways, thank you so much to my patrons who support me making these dragons. Kimba, Cool Cloud, ADH Dream 1409, Kitten Mikey, Haps, Samuel Sanchez, Maisie Peach, Lisa Aguado, Mono Dia, Aninka Lemason, Grey, Solvai, Phoenix Fire, I Like the Dumb Bunny Shrimp, Fennec is here, and Trooper Cat.